Joseph announced he was going to file for divorce, a decision that came as a shock, despite my firm stance against it. Quinn, standing by his side, begged me to make things right soon. I had always thought my dedication to Joseph and Quinn was unwavering, but I was beginning to doubt myself. Despite believing that living together was a sign of commitment, I had been hesitant about moving in with them for nearly five years. It seemed I had reached my breaking point. Eventually, I gave in to Joseph's demands, packed my things, and left. Afterwards, Joseph kept calling me. My name is Bella, and I'm nearing my 45th birthday. Joseph and I have been married for 18 years, but our relationship lacked the spark of passion, even in the early days. Joseph never showed much interest in romantic gestures, and I felt the same indifference from him. We have two child who has already moved out, leaving just the two of us at home. Joseph has a strong personality, which can be quite overbearing. However, I've always been more laid back and didn't mind his temperament. We've been a couple since high school, and even though I had my doubts when he proposed, I eventually said yes. In the beginning, I was a stay-at-home spouse, taking care of the house as my in-laws wanted. When our child was born, the grandparents were thrilled and visited often. Although initially, Joseph and I agreed not to live with his parents, he later suggested we move in with them. Despite our child growing up and becoming more self-sufficient, I stood firm against the idea of living with my in-laws, a stance I maintained whenever it came up. Joseph and I had many arguments about this, but I always refused. Joseph would get upset, probably hoping I would change my mind. My reluctance stemmed from two main issues. First, I never got along well with my mother-in-law, Quinn. After we got married, Quinn would often call me over for trivial reasons, and despite my efforts to help, she would complain. You're late. How long do you think I've been waiting? The TV isn't working. Can you take a look? At first, these seemed like small annoyances, but over time, Quinn's behavior became more aggressive. At one family lunch, everyone was served sushi except me, leaving me to eat alone at a diner. Quinn's hostility grew, and when I tried to talk to Joseph about it, he saw it as an attack on his mother and shut me out. This made it even harder for me to open up to him. Joseph's attitude toward me changed after that. He stopped helping. Around the house, even with simple requests, his mood soured as I continued to resist moving in with his parents. His behavior grew worse. He started coming home late, suggesting he was seeing someone else. Joseph's neglect continued, and he openly hinted at being unfaithful. I'm going out for drinks with a lady tonight, so I'll be late, he'd say, only to return the next afternoon. This went on for four years. No matter how much love fades, being treated this way by a partner is unbearable. I reached a point of exhaustion that didn't go unnoticed. Even my children started expressing their concern. My friends began to point out how much weight I had lost and how tired I appeared, advising me to take better care of myself by eating well and resting. Deep down, I knew I needed to make some changes, but I found it hard to take the first step. Then, an opportunity arose when a friend offered me a job at her flower shop. She owned the place and was looking for someone to fill an open position, hoping it might help improve my mood. Upon telling Joseph and Quinn about my new job, their reaction was lukewarm. It's good you're working. We all need to pitch in, they said. Joseph admitted that while we could manage on his income alone, having mine would offer extra financial stability. Quinn also made it clear she expected me to contribute to the household expenses. Despite their expectations, I made it clear that my decision to work was not just for their sake. The job at the flower shop turned out to be a blessing. It not only lifted my spirits, but also led others to notice a positive change in my demeanor, saying I seemed happier. Being a stay-at-home mom had its challenges, especially dealing with Joseph and Quinn's demands, which often left me feeling deflated. But interacting with diverse customers and engaging in work I enjoyed brought me a sense of fulfillment I hadn't felt in a long time, making me dread the idea of going home. To avoid spending time at home, I frequently told Joseph I had to work late or made plans to dine out with friends. This went on for about a year. Around five years after we first discussed the idea of living together, Joseph confronted me. He criticized my increased time outside the home, my careless spending, and my neglect of household duties, labeling me as lazy and unnecessary in the household. He added that he would overlook these issues if I agreed to move in with him, as I stood my ground. Quinn entered the conversation, accusing me of wrongdoing for not wanting to live together. Joseph supported her, blaming my attitude. I stood firm on my decision not to move in with them, but they didn't seem to understand. Joseph then threatened divorce if I didn't comply, while Quinn begged me to take care of them. 
Despite everything I had endured, this confrontation was the breaking point. I managed to stay calm at the moment, but the following day, I decided to leave. I waited until Joseph was at work, unsure of where to go until I thought of my parents. To my surprise, when I called them, they were supportive and willing to pick me up. Even my mom, who had previously pressured me to marry, welcomed me back without any resentment. After sharing my situation with my mom, she suggested I come back in a few hours. When I did, my parents were ready with a large van they had rented, showing their support in a big way. This gesture made me feel deeply loved, and I decided to move all my stuff out that very night. Not long after, Joseph called me, realizing I had taken my belongings from the house. You're not seriously thinking about leaving me, are you? He asked. I firmly told him that I was indeed planning to divorce him, mentioning the divorce lawyer's business card I left on the table for him to use for any future communications. Joseph's reaction was one of anger and threats. He demanded to know where I was, threatening to teach me a lesson. Although he had never been physically violent, his tone made me cautious about direct communication. Despite being taken aback by the mention of a lawyer, Joseph's fury quickly returned, fueled by Quinn's encouragement in the background, suggesting he could easily find someone else and should pursue the divorce. Joseph then tried to intimidate me further, questioning my decision to divorce him and arrogantly stating I wouldn't find someone like him again before hanging up. After this call, I heard nothing more from Joseph or Quinn, enjoying a peaceful break at my parents, where I worked at a friend's flower shop. They kindly gave me some time off, allowing me to enjoy my mom's cooking and my dad's company, a welcome respite from recent stresses. However, Joseph started calling me angrily again after speaking with the lawyer, ignoring my request to communicate only through legal representation. It became clear that Joseph was particularly insensate because I had evidence that would be favorable to me in the divorce proceedings. Over time, I had recorded conversations of him hinting at infidelity, suspecting our marriage might end in divorce. A private investigator confirmed his affair, and while Joseph denied any wrongdoing, demanding proof, the recordings provided clear evidence of his actions. Surprisingly, after a few days of hostility, Joseph agreed to the divorce, a decision seemingly influenced by Quinn's willingness to cover the compensation fee. I was surprised by Quinn's financial involvement but saw it as an opportunity to facilitate the divorce process. After negotiating with my lawyer, we agreed to lower the compensation demand, a strategy often used to reach an agreement more smoothly. This adjustment helped move things forward, allowing us to finalize the divorce terms more amicably. As I was nearing the final stages of my divorce, unexpected drama unfolded. Joseph, intending to move back in with his in-laws, walked into a storm. He discovered Quinn, his mother, in a fiery argument with her father, Anthony, over Quinn's extramarital affair. Anthony, having lost his patience, demanded they both leave his home, accusing them of infidelity. Quinn tried to deny the accusations, but her defense fell apart when Anthony presented clear photographic evidence of her with another man. Joseph, caught in the crossfire, vehemently denied any wrongdoing on his part, dismissing the accusations against him as a setup. The altercation was so intense that it caught the attention of the entire neighborhood, a fact I learned from a friend who lived nearby. It's often said that certain traits run in families, but this situation seemed to underline that adage with a bitter twist. Anthony had meticulously compiled evidence of Quinn's affair, much like I had gathered proof in my own situation. He had hired a detective and had photos and emails that left no room for doubt about Quinn's actions. Anthony's evidence wasn't just limited to photos, he had emails that explicitly confirmed the affair. Quinn, not being tech-savvy, had left her email unprotected, which made it easy to gather this incriminating evidence. Sharing a similar ordeal, Anthony and I found common ground in our experiences. He showed me the photographs he had used to confront Quinn, which were as clear as the ones I had obtained, showcasing undeniable acts of infidelity. Having solid evidence is crucial, as my lawyer had emphasized. It not only supports the case, but also highlights the seriousness of the relationship's breakdown, making a strong case for divorce. Unlike Anthony, who hesitated to end his marriage even after discovering the affair, I had already braced myself for the possibility of ending mine. Anthony's decision to stay in his marriage despite the evidence was influenced by the deep ties he felt to his wife, forged over many years. This situation made me reflect on how long-term relationships sometimes continue more out of habit than love. Effective communication can mitigate such issues, but in my case, Joseph and I were simply incompatible. Joseph and Quinn's situation escalated to the point where they were evicted, 
forced to find a modest monthly rental. Known for their extravagant spending habits, they quickly ran through their savings. When they asked me for financial help with their rent, I refused, having already divorced Joseph without any alimony. Since the divorce, I've made it a point to inform our mutual acquaintances about Joseph's actions, leading to him being ostracized by many. Our shared history dates back to college, where we shared numerous mutual friends. At a recent reunion, when asked about my current situation and Joseph, I chose to be transparent about everything that had happened, maintaining my integrity by opting for honesty over deceit. After my divorce from Joseph, I discovered he and Quinn had been borrowing money from old classmates, straining these friendships. One of our mutual friends shared their disappointment with me, lamenting over lending Joseph a significant sum because of their past friendship, only to realize it was unlikely to be repaid. This friend was also upset about how Joseph had treated me, wishing I had shared my troubles sooner. As word spread, support for me grew while Joseph found himself increasingly isolated. Joseph's financial desperation led him to scour supermarkets late at night for discounted food. I, unexpectedly, ran into him one evening, watching as he impatiently waited for items to be marked down. It was clear he was struggling. He even argued with the cashier for additional discounts and left in a huff when his demands were met with refusal. Outside, I overheard him arguing with Quinn about their dearie financial situation, making it evident they were having trouble affording even the basics. After witnessing this, I made a swift exit, reflecting on my own journey. Post-divorce, I re-entered the workforce, securing a contract position that surprisingly led to an offer for full-time employment. This opportunity challenged me but also allowed me to grow professionally, despite initial self-doubt and the youthfulness of my managers. Their support and training enabled me to excel, and I was soon considered for a more permanent role with better pay and prospects. With my savings, I decided to purchase a condo, choosing independence and a fresh start over the possibility of remarrying. This decision was partly motivated by a desire to avoid awkward encounters with Joseph and Quinn, which had previously happened at in places like Walmart. The thought of seeing Joseph again was unsettling, but he hadn't reached out for reconciliation or financial assistance. Nonetheless, I took the advice of my loved ones to heart and chose a condo in a location that offered both distance from my past and convenience for my new life. The condo was ideal for someone single like me, offering enough space without being overly large, and situated in an area with good transport links to downtown, ensuring a balance of solitude and accessibility. About seven months after moving into my condo, I began to feel a bit lonely. Without any intention of getting married again and considering the condo too compact for roommates, I found myself reflecting on my solitary life. It was during one of these reflective moments that I discovered a stray kitten right outside my apartment. Initially, I thought to just watch it, hoping its mother would come back for it. But when the kitten was still there the next day, looking as helpless and crying just as pitifully as before, I knew I had to do something. With the cold season approaching, the thought of leaving the kitten outside in the freezing temperatures was unbearable. After talking it over with my building manager, who confirmed that pets were allowed, I decided to take the kitten in. This little bundle of fur quickly adapted to its new home, greeting me with enthusiastic runs to the door whenever I returned showing no fussiness about food and cuddling up in my bed on chilly mornings. I hadn't been much of a cat person previously, but this kitten changed everything. I've become that person who proudly shows off photos of their pet at work, constantly talking about how adorable my feline friend is. My colleagues in good humor agree that my furry child is the cutest of all, and I find myself wholeheartedly believing it. Fortunately, I have friends who are cat owners themselves, so I never feel lost or overwhelmed. They're always ready to offer advice. Now, the highlight of my day is coming home to my little cat, who waits for me eagerly. This unexpected companionship has brought a new joy into my life, making every day a bit brighter.